Elizabeth Warren's humiliating self-own, the media give President Trump a reason to question fake news again, and Hillary will never leave. I'm Ben Shapiro, this is The Ben Shapiro Show. Oh, Elizabeth Warren, the smoke signals for 2020 have never been stronger, but it seems as though she has just collapsed her own wigwam. I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know, man. Uh, her TP, her TP, not her. I don't know. In any case, it's just it's spectacular stuff. I can't wait to get this Elizabeth Warren story. But first, let's talk about how you can save save money on stamps. So these days, you can save money on practically anything by never having to leave your house because time is money. Except you still have to go to the post office for stamps. Except you don't anymore. Now you can go over to stamps.com. You can access all the amazing services of the post office right from your desk, twenty four seven, when it is convenient for you. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter and any package using your own computer and printer. The mail carrier picks it up. You click, print, mail, you're done. Could not be easier. We use stamps.com here at the Daily Wire offices, and it is spectacular. Saves us time, saves us money. And right now, when you use promo code Shapiro, you get a special offer. 55 bucks of free postage, a digital scale, and a four-week trial. Go to stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on that radio microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Shapiro. That is stamps.com. Enter promo code Shapiro for that special deal. 55 bucks of free postage, a digital scale, and a four-week trial. Go check it out right now. Again, stamps.com, promo code Shapiro. All the services of the post office directly at your fingertips. It's pretty spectacular, which is why we use it. Stamps.com, use that promo code Shapiro for the special deal. All right, so Elizabeth Warren, making my day great again. So Elizabeth Warren is the senator from Massachusetts. I knew her a little bit when I was at Harvard Law School because she was a property professor there, pretty popular property professor. The first time I met her, she literally the first time I met her, she was recruiting for Harvard Law School and she ripped on Rush Limbaugh. So that was a pretty good opener for what Elizabeth Warren was politically. Well, Elizabeth Warren today decided that she would engage in the most humiliating self-own I have ever seen in American politics. I mean, this is like the best self-own of all time. This is the equivalent to that guy who owned gold during the World Cup and then got killed for it. Hopefully nothing bad happens to Elizabeth Warren. Nobody is calling for violence, but this is a really bad own goal. My goodness. So we have to travel back in time to a time when Elizabeth Warren claims that she was in fact Native American. She said that she had high Cherokee cheekbones. She suggested in a, in a recipe book called Pow Wow Chow, I kid you not, that she was a Native American. And the recipe she submitted to Pow Wow Chow was a, resp a recipe, again, I kid you not, for crab bisque because Clearly, that was something the Cherokees made back in the day. Crab bisque, the noted crab herds of the Oklahoma Plains that her ancestors used to hunt. Elizabeth Warren told this story over and over about her Native American ancestry. And what she said was that there were racist members of her family who couldn't accept her parents' romance because her mom was partially Native American. Here's Elizabeth Warren telling the romantic story. Actually, you have it wrong about what it is, I believe. Mm -hmm. let's, let's start there. Tell us what we're doing. Okay. My mom and dad uh, were very much in love with each other, and they wanted to get married. And my father's parents said, absolutely not. You can't marry her because she's part Cherokee and she's part Delaware. And um, after fighting it as long as they could, my parents went off. They eloped. Okay, so her parents eloped because her mom was part Cherokee and part Delaware which means you would think pretty hefty dose of Native American ancestry right there, right? I mean, if, if her family is worried about it, then sounds like that would be some significant Native American ancestry. So President Trump didn't believe this because it's nonsense. They, people actually checked into her background. They found there's no Native American ancestry anywhere in the, in, the, in the time horizon of rationality. So President Trump went out on the campaign trail. This is back in 2017, I believe. And he was holding a rally in Montana. And he suggested that he would give her a million dollars if she could prove her Native American ancestry. And we will say, I will give you a million dollars to your favorite charity, paid for by Trump, if you take the test and it shows you're an Indian, you know. So today, Elizabeth Warren came forward with the evidence that she was, in fact, Native American. Now, I think that it is important to note if you don't believe in media bias, you have to check out the headlines today because the headlines today are truly astonishing. The headline today from the Daily Beast suggests that there is strong evidence that she is Native American. Okay, this, it says, this is the actual title. Elizabeth Warren DNA test reveals Native American ancestry. Her claims to indigenous heritage had been ridiculed by Trump. CNN had a headline about Elizabeth Warren. Same thing, he says, Trump offered $1 million. Now he says, 
Who cares? And Elizabeth Warren releases tests with strong evidence of ancestry. And then analysis, why Elizabeth Warren is number one in our new 2020 rankings. So CNN obviously has a pretty strong agenda here. So what this would suggest, if you just read those headlines, is she took a DNA test and it found that a great grandparent was Native American or something. Well, well, not so much. So she took a DNA test. And here's what it showed. This is according to the Boston Globe. The analysis of Warren's DNA was done by Carlos Bustamante, a Stanford University professor and expert in the field who won a 2010 MacArthur Fellowship, also known as a Genius Grant, for his work on tracking population migration via DNA analysis. He concluded that the vast majority of Warren's ancestry is European, but he added that the results strongly support the existence of an unadmixed Native American ancestor. So what exactly does that mean? Here's what it means. Bustamante calculated that Warren's pure Native American ancestor appears in her family tree in the range of six to 10 generations ago. Six to 10 generations ago. In other words, her actual Native American ancestor could be Pocahontas. Yeah, it takes you back like 200 years. That's it. Just, to, just to be straight about this, her claim that she has Native American ancestry was that her parent, her mom was so Native American that she was discriminated against by her dad's family. That is not the same thing as her great, 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 great grandparent minimum was Native American. Not, not the same thing at all. And by the way, that is not the outer limit of the test. The test shows, shows that at best, at best, she was a sixth generation Native American. At worst, at worst, it's 10th, which would mean that she had an ancestor, her great, 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 great grandparent who was Native American. Okay, the, the, the best part of this Boston Globe story, it's really, really spectacular. So it says, the inherent imprecision of the six-page DNA analysis could provide fodder for Warren's critics. You think? If her great-great-great-grandmother was Native American, that puts her at 132nd American Indian. But no one says she's 132nd. The minimum, right? The minimum is that she is one, I think it was 1,512th or something. She's not, that, that like, 132nd is not actually a, a sixth-generation Native American. That's, that's like a fourth-generation Native American. In any case... The report includes the possibility that she is just one 1,024th Native American if the ancestor is 10 generations back. One 1,024th. I love this. So here, here's the even better part. To make up for the dearth of Native American ancestry, DNA, Bustamante used samples from Mexico, Peru, and Colombia to stand in for Native American. So in other words, he didn't even use like Cherokee DNA to match her up. He used Mexican, Peruvian, and Colombian DNA to match up. So what it really shows is that she's 1 1,024th Mexican, Peruvian, or Colombian. So awesome. Awesome. I love this. It says, Warren has 12 times more Native American blood than a white person from Great Britain and 10 times more than a white person from Utah, the report found. Well, there's only one problem with that. What the actual study shows that the average American in the United States, of any race, the average American in the United States is 0.18% is 0.18% Native American. Okay, that, that is what, and by the way, you're not accepted as a Native American in a Native American tribe unless you are at least 1 16th Native American, meaning that you had a great grandparent who was Native American. So we are now going back 10 generations to try and claim that she is a Native American because she claimed, I guess, a University of Pennsylvania Native American heritage and all the rest. He, she is 0.009% Native American. And she's bragging about this. Right? This is her claim. And the media are saying, well, this should put this thing to bed. This should put it to bed. That is not, that is not what she said. That's not what she said at all. At all. It's spectacular. She's 99.999% white. <laughs> Matt Walsh has a good tweet about this. He says, after finding out that Warren is a staggering 99.999% white, Richard Spencer is expected to endorse her for president. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, I love it so much. I love it so much. So, by the way, according to science, just want to get this straight. According to science, if you are one 1,024th Native American, that is strong evidence of Native American ancestry. If you have two X chromosomes, this doesn't mean you're a woman. And that's according to the media. This is science, people. This isn't politics. It's science. So... I have suggested publicly, as others have done, I'm not the only one or probably the first person to have suggested this, President Trump 
should not give $1 million to Elizabeth Warren. He should give her one one thousand twenty fourth of a million dollars. He should sign her a $900 check because that's how Native American she is. <laughs> it's so good. And he should put it, he should print it out at a giant publisher's clearinghouse check. And he should sign it to Elizabeth Warren. And in the subject line, he should write, failing 2020 campaign. It's just spectacular. It's just spectacular. So I love that. And again, you have to love the media bias here. If, if anybody claimed this on the right, are you kidding me? If I claimed that I had Native American ancestry and then people are like, well, Ben, you're pretty Jewish. And I like, well, you know, if I take a 23andMe test and it shows that 10 generations ago, maybe someone with some DNA in common with a Colombian person was in my ancestry, would that make you Native American? Also, I, I do love this. Yeah, the, the, again, the idea that she is Native American based on an ancestor 10 generations ago, that's insane. There's not, even the greatest racist, like the greatest racist on earth would not call her Native American. The people who hate Native Americans would not call her Native American based on that ancestry. You know, Nazis, not real fond of Jews. They cut off Jewish ancestry at second generation, at third generation. They said, if you have four German grandparents, then you are considered fully German. Okay, and those people were super giant racists. So the left is now even more racist than the biggest racist because they are saying that if you have one tiny drop of Native American ancestry from 400 years ago, now you're Native American. I wonder how Native Americans feel about this. It can't be great. It can't be great. Really, really astonishing. So it's just, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's so good. We'll have more on this. I, I, I love it so. I love it so. Ah, it's so great. I have more on this in just one second. But first, let's talk about the air that you're breathing. So there's a new study. It just came out of China, and it discovered that air pollution causes a huge reduction in intelligence, which might explain our nation's politics right now. High pollution levels le led to significant drops in test scores with language and arithmetic, the average impact equivalent to having lost an entire year of education. Well, now we know what happened to all the people who protest me when I go to college campuses. But it is important for you to have clean air in your home. With 95% of the global population breathing unsafe air, you ought to have filters in your house that work. Filterby.com is America's leading provider of HVAC filters for homes and small businesses. You can choose from over 600 sizes, including custom options that ship free within 24 hours. Plus, they support working Americans manufacturing all their filters right here in America. Save 5% when you subscribe for auto replacement, so you'll never forget to change your filters ever again. Filter by will save you time, money, you're going to breathe better. Apparently, you become more intelligent in the process, which is awesome for you. So stop procrastinating. Go to filterbuy.com. That's filterbuy.com. Tell them that we sent you. We use filter by here in the office. I've used it at my house as well. Go check it out right now. Filterbuy.com. That's filterbuy.com. So spectacular. So Elizabeth Warren just making a mockery of herself and not even knowing it and the media playing along. Now, the question is, what motivated her to do this? Right? What, what made her do this? What made Elizabeth Warren think this is a great idea? The answer is that what made her think, by the way, how, how great idea did she think this was? She went home and she filmed a video with a bunch of her family members complaining about how Trump was mean for suggesting she didn't have Native American ancestry. Uh-huh. She obviously is prepping for a presidential run, but this is so... My God. You know, how, you know how white Elizabeth Warren is? Look at the back of this paper. Okay, this paper right here is less white than, than Elizabeth Warren is because you can still see the ink through it a little bit. Okay, Elizabeth Warren is more white than this piece of paper. And yet she is proclaiming that she's Native American. It's so good. It's just... It's so good. Okay, so... Ah, love it. But why did she do this? She did this because she knew the media would cover for her anyway. So the so the the media wrote a bunch of headlines saying that now she had been now she had been justified. She had been justified in her accusations. She had been justified in her claims. And she is calling on President Trump to sign her a million dollar check because she is possibly 0.09% Native American. Solid, solid stuff there. But she's right, because the media do back her play. No matter what she does, the media will back her play. And that's obvious from the weekend's media coverage. The media, you know, it's, it's funny. Folks on the left suggest that the people on the right are bitter clingers. We cling to God and we cling to guns and we cling to, and we cling to our American status. We cling to our borders and we cling to our language. We cling to all sorts of terrible things. You remember Barack Obama blamed evil Republicanism on being bitter clingers. 
Elizabeth Warren is bitterly clinging on to this narrative and the media are bitterly clinging on along with her. And then they are clinging on to a bunch of other false narratives that they are putting out. Now, all they have to do, I've said this on CNN, all that the media have to do in order to undermine President Trump is just try to stick to the truth. They can't do it. There's nothing that they can do that, that will force them to stick to the truth. And I have the evidence of this. So over the weekend, there were two separate, two separate major media stories that turned out to be basically false about President Trump. Story number one. Here is a, an NBC tweet about a rally that President Trump did, I believe, Friday night. It says, watch. President Trump says Robert E. Lee was a great general during Ohio rally, calling the Confederate leader incredible. Now you'd think, well, that's bad stuff. You probably shouldn't call a Confederate leader incredible. It is true, by the way, that Robert E. Lee was a, a good general. I don't think he was a great general, but he was a good general. That doesn't mean that he was a good person or that he believed good things. But that was the headline for NBC News. The headline for NBC News is that Trump said that Robert E. Lee was a great general and called the Confederate leader incredible. Now, here is what President Trump actually said about Robert E. Lee. Here's the clip of President Trump talking. And one day, it was looking really bad. And Lincoln just said, you hardly knew his name. And they said, don't take him. He's got a drinking problem. <laughs> and Lincoln said, I don't care what problem he has. You guys aren't winning. <laughs> and his name was Grant, General Grant. <laughs> and Lincoln said, I don't care if he's an alcoholic. Frankly, give me six or seven more just like him. OK, so there is Trump actually talking about Grant. What he was saying is that Robert E. Lee was a great general who was overcome by Grant. He was not saying that Robert E. Lee was a wonderful, wonderful person standing for wonderful things. So NBC has to actually correct it. So Trump tweets this out. He says, you guys, you got this wrong. You got this wrong. So here's President Trump's tweet. NBC News has totally and purposely changed the point and meaning of my story about General Robert E. Lee and General Ulysses Grant was actually a shout out to Warrior Grant and the great state in which he was born. As usual, dishonest reporting, even mainstream media embarrassed. And NBC had to tweet out a correction. They tweeted out a full correction. Correction, an earlier tweet misidentified the general President Trump described as incredible at a rally in Ohio. It was General Ulysses S. Grant, not General Robert E. Lee. An attached video clip lacked the full context for Trump's remark. Here is the full clip. It took NBC News two full days to retract it. Two full days. And that wasn't the only example of ridiculous media bias in the last 48 hours. So CBS tweeted this out about President Trump on 60 Minutes. So last night, President Trump was on 60 Minutes. Here's what they tweeted. They tweeted, President Trump on his treatment of Christine Blasey Ford at rally, at the accuser of just, now Justice Brett Kavanaugh. It doesn't matter. We won. Makes it sound like the question was, do you care that you mocked Christine Blasey Ford? And Trump says, it doesn't matter. We won. Well, there's only one problem. That is clearly not what Trump was saying. Like, clearly not what Trump was saying. Here is President Trump actually talking. We need the actual clip of President Trump talking from, from 60 Minutes. Um, and here he is. Uh, here he is in context. That is absolutely not what he's saying. Professor Blasey Ford, you mimicked her. Had I not made that speech, we would not have won. I was just saying she didn't seem to know anything. No, you and you're trying to destroy a life of a man who has been extraordinary. Why did you have to make fun of her? I didn't really make fun. Well, they were laughing. What I said is the person that we're talking about didn't know the year, the time, the place. Professor Blasey Ford got before the Senate and, and was asked, what's the worst moment? And she said, when the two boys laughed at me at my expense. Okay. And then I watched you mimic her and thousands of people were laughing at her. They can do what they, I, I will tell you, this, the way now Justice Kavanaugh was treated has become a big factor in the midterms. Have you seen what's gone on with the polls? But did you have to? Well, I think she was treated with great respect. I, I know, I'll but, be honest. But, but do you think there you are those treated that think her she with, shouldn't have been. Do you think you treated her with great respect? I think so, yeah, I did. But you seem to be saying that she lied. Uh, well, you know what? I'm not going to get into it because we won. It doesn't matter. Well, we won. Okay, so clearly he's not saying, I don't care that you're accusing me of mocking her because we won. He is saying, I'm not going to get into this with you. It's over. We're done. The media covered this as though he was saying that he didn't care that he had mocked her, which is actually not what he said. So they took that out of context, too. 
It's just amazing. It's just amazing. So again, when President Trump slams the so-called fake news, when they actually are participating in fake news, they absolutely 100% deserve it. They absolutely 100% deserve all of it. Okay, in a second, we're going to go through an epic episode of some good Trump, bad Trump, because President Trump was on 60 Minutes yesterday. But first, let's talk about how you are going to relax. So does this news cycle make you want to relax? Do you need to relax a little bit? I mean, I know you're boneless from laughter over Elizabeth Warren's claim that she is Native American. But still, if you're a little bit stressed out over the midterm elections or anything else in your life, you really need to talk to my friends over at Zeal. You go to zeal.com or Zeal's iPhone or Android app, Z-E-E-L.com, and you can select from top local, licensed, pre-screened massage therapists. Choose your favorite technique, gender preference, time and location for your massage, and Zeal will then send you one of their 10,000 licensed massage therapists with a massage table, music, and supplies to give you a five-star massage. Scheduling, booking, payment, fast and easy. Even the tip is included seven days a week, 365 days a year. A Zeal massage therapist can be at your door in as little as an hour. They've been featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Vogue, Good Morning America. They are on demand. They make it really easy. I've gotten Zeal massages for pretty much every member of my family at this point. My sister, my mom, my dad, my in-laws, my wife. I mean, we've really... Zeal's great, they, and all of their all their folks are terrific. To help you get started right now, our listeners can get 25 bucks off their first massage with promo code Ben at zeel.com. Promo code Ben right now. Go to zeel.com. Get a special offer when you try Zeal today. Enter promo code Ben or get 25 to get 25 bucks off your first in-home massage. Go check it out right now. Okay, so final note. I just have to say this final note on this Elizabeth Warren thing. The the left is now trying to gaslight. So they say Elizabeth Warren says that she is. Native American. And then we go, well, no, she's not. And then she says, okay, well, here's a DNA test proving that I'm pretty much not Native American. And we go, right, because we said she wasn't. And they said, nope, no, no. We said pretty much not. 10 generations ago, she had a Native American ancestor. And we're like, right, but that's not really Native American. They're like, well, you must be a racist because you don't think that she's Native American based on an ancestor 10 generations ago with Colombian DNA. Okay, you don't get to do that. And Elizabeth Warren is, is obviously kicking into high troll, high troll mode. So she actually tweeted out this morning that President Trump is, uh, th that President Trump has apparently forgotten about his promises to pay her money. It says, having some memory problems, Mr. Trump, should we call for a doctor? Here's something you won't forget, Mr. President. You're the least popular president in modern history and your allies will go down hard in the midterm elections. 22 days, tick tock, tick tock. So basically Michael Avenatti just took over Elizabeth Warren's Twitter feed. Good luck with, with all of this for the Democrats. Now, with all of that said, President Trump was on 60 Minutes last night. He did, overall, I think, a, a pretty good job because he was dealing with an interviewer in Leslie Stahl who is wildly anti-Trump, really, really hates Trump, and you can tell from the questions. But it was a pretty, I'd say it was a pretty epic episode of Good Trump, Bad Trump. So I have been the progenitor, like the actual creator, not 10 generations ago, the actual creator of Good Trump, Bad Trump, you know, this model that says sometimes the president says good things and sometimes the president says bad things. And we have a theme song for it. We haven't played it in a while, but today seemed an apt day. So let's play a little Good Trump, Bad Trump. Good Trump, Bad Trump, which one will we get today? Okay, so on the Good Trump side, uh, I have to acknowledge that the president did quote tweet me this morning, which was kind of fun. So he watched my final Sunday special on Fox News and he tweeted out, the only way to shut down the Democrats' new mob rule strategy is to stop them cold at the ballot box. The fight for America's future is never over. Ben Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it. So that's good Trump. Other good Trump, he said some, he said some interesting things on 60 Minutes. And when he talked about the Democrats not wanting the country to heal, this obviously was correct. Here is President Trump going after the Democrats. He is not wrong about this, considering that Elizabeth Warren today is doing the everybody hates you, Mr. Trump, and my Native American ancestry is real, and Hillary saying no civility for Republicans and all the rest. Here is President Trump talking about Democrats wanting to divide the country. We need to be healed. We need. I don't think they want to heal yet. I'll be honest. Well, you don't I want think, to heal yet. I, I, I saw Hillary Clinton made a really nasty statement. I don't think they want to be healed. I do want to heal. Okay, so I agree that the Democrats don't want the country to heal. Uh, I'm not sure that President Trump is the most healing president, but we will count this in the category of good Trump. In the category of bad Trump, here was President Trump talking about Saudi Arabia. So he has made a couple of comments. What he said on 60 Minutes was not bad, but Saudi Arabia is enmeshed in a massive scandal right now because there's this guy named Jamal Khashoggi. And Jamal Khashoggi was a person who wrote op-eds for the Washington Post. 
He was a longtime retainer of the Saudi royal family and a critic of the regime. He entered the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey on October 2nd, seeking documents relevant to a divorce. The Turkish government claims that they have proof that a Saudi hit squad murdered him inside the consulate, chopped his body up, and then dispatched the remains in a black van to a private plane headed for Saudi Arabia. And there's not a lot of doubt that Khashoggi is dead at this point. This has created worldwide consternation against the Saudi government, and in particular, against Prince Mohammed bin Sultan, who's considered the new leader of Saudi Arabia, the new dictator of Saudi Arabia. A, a few comments are necessary on this to, to understand what's going on exactly here. Number one, Saudi Arabia is a tyrannical dictatorship led by people who are tyrannical dictators. It's a monarchy. They chop people's hands off regularly. They imprison dissidents. They are not a human rights friendly country. Mohammed bin Sultan was supposed to be a reformer, but even as a reformer, he's still the dictator of Saudi Arabia. This is not a supremely shocking story on any level other than we know the name of the guy who has disappeared as opposed to presumably many other people whose names we don't know who have been disappeared. Second, the Turkish government has a pretty strong interest in trying to humiliate the Saudis because the Turkish government has basically been anti-Saudi for years. They're in bed with the Iranian government at this point and uh, to a certain extent in bed with the Syrian government as well. All of that said, the Turkish government releasing evidence in an attempt to make it look like they are our friends. Erdogan, who's the leader of Turkey, also an Islamist thug who has imprisoned dissidents and killed dissidents too. So there are no good guys in this part of the world, uh, at least not in leadership positions. In any case, the call for the United States to distance itself from the Saudi Arabian government after all of this, I think is appropriate. But I think it's also appropriate to note that the outsized consternation with regard to Khashoggi, which when I say outsized, I don't mean that it's inappropriate. It's totally appropriate. But when compared to the amount of consternation over Turkey imprisoning thousands of people and until a minute ago imprisoning a U.S. pastor or Syria murdering half a million people or Iran pursuing terrorism across the region, it's, it is amazing how the human brain has the capacity to hone in on a single incident of evil in a way that it doesn't on literally hundreds of thousands of incidents of evil. But with all of that said, the United States does have to do something if the Saudi Arabian government is calling dissidents back to consulates and then murdering them. That's not a, that, that, is, that is a bad thing. Here's President Trump on 60 Minutes talking about it. He changed his tune a little bit today. They are ordering military equipment. Everybody in the world wanted that order. Russia wanted it. China wanted it. We wanted it. We got it. So would you cut that off? Do I, well, I tell you what I don't want to do. Boeing, Lockheed, Raytheon, all these, I don't want to hurt jobs. I don't want to lose an order like that. There are other ways of uh, punishing. punishing, to use a word that's a pretty harsh word, but it's true. Okay, so you know when, when he says that he wants to maintain certain economic ties, that's not great Trump, right? He needs to actually be exerting pressure on the Saudis for reform. Now, he has to do that carefully because he also doesn't want to give a lot of leeway and leverage to the Iranians who are enemies with the Saudi regime and have been fighting a proxy war in Yemen with the Saudis. Like there, again, there are no good guys in this particular area of the world. But with that said, you know, the president ought to be signaling some pretty harsh rhetoric with regard to the Khashoggi situation. He is not. So that one files under bad Trump today. He said that the Saudi Arabian government denies it. They say that it's not real, so we're just going to ignore it. That is not great stuff from the president. Okay, other stuff that the president said during the 60 Minutes interview. Here is some other bad Trump. Here's President Trump on Kim Jong-un, uh, the, the dictator, another evil dictator, uh, and he had some warm words for him. I know, I know but things. why do you love that guy? Look, look. Mm. I, have, I, I like, I get along with him, okay? But you and said I say, love him. Okay, that's, that's just like a figure of speech. No, it's like an embrace. You, you, well, let it be an embrace. Let it be whatever yeah, it is to get the job He's a bad done. guy. Look, let it be whatever it is. I get along with him really well. I have a good energy with him. I have a good chemistry with him. Look at the horrible threats that were made. No more threats. No more threats. Okay, so, you know, him, him talking about Kim that way is not good either. You actually have to demonstrate a strong hand. And President Trump did that early in his presidency with Kim, but he's not really doing that anymore. So there's a lot of good Trump, bad Trump happening uh, with, with regard to 60 Minutes, but that's who the president is. And it is important to note that his ups and downs are indicative of the man's mind. I mean, that's just who President Trump is. So in just a second, I want to get to the other big story of the weekend, which was these violent clashes happening in Portland and New York between Antifa and the Proud Boys. But first, let's talk about ExpressVPN. So you need to protect your internet access. Whether you're in a cafe or a hotel, 
We often rely on public Wi-Fi to use the internet on the go, but something as simple as paying your bills online from a Starbucks could actually leave your data exposed. A hacker could easily intercept your information, stealing passwords, credit cards, personal details. It's not just hackers either. Government agencies like the NSA, they monitor the internet and they could scoop up your activity. So what can you do to defend yourself? Well, the software I use to protect my online activity from spies and data thieves is called ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN has easy to use apps that run seamlessly in the background of my computer, phone, and tablet. ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes my internet browsing. It encrypts my data. It hides my public IP address. So using ExpressVPN, I can safely search on public Wi-Fi anytime I want, and it costs less than seven bucks a month. Comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can try it. See if you like it, you will. To take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months for free, go to expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben for three months free with a one-year package. Again, ExpressVPN, secure your internet now. That's expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. Go check it out right now. Okay, so while President Trump was participating in good Trump, bad Trump, Hillary Clinton was just participating in normal Hillary, which is just bad Hillary. There is no good Hillary. We'll get to that in just a second. You're going to have to go over to dailywire.com and subscribe for the rest of today's hilarious and entertaining episode, $9.99 a month. Get to a subscription to The Daily Wire. That means you also get this show live, Michael Moles' show live, Andrew Clavin's show live, and you get access to Another Kingdom. We have new episodes, season two of Another Kingdom coming up, and the first one came out on Friday. It has some pretty awesome graphics and, and art attached to it, so that's pretty fun. Also, it's almost time for our next episode of The Conversation. Tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Eastern, 2.30 p.m. Pacific, Drew, Andrew Clavin, will be taking your questions and answering them live on air, hosted by Alicia Krause. You'll get a full hour of Drew's infinite wisdom that famously produces world-class leftist tears, finely ground and honed to perfection by blind nuns in the Swiss Alps. As always, this episode will be free for everyone to watch on Facebook and YouTube, but only subscribers can ask the questions, so don't miss Drew's next chapter of Another Kingdom either, by the way, which, as I say, was performed by Michael Moles. And today's subscribers get exclusive access to episode three as well. This one is titled The Beast, obviously about President Trump. If you're not a subscriber, you won't be able to watch new episodes of season two until Friday. So what exactly are you waiting for? Go to dailywire.com. Subscribe to watch the first and second seasons of Another Kingdom. And you get all of these glories, all these wonderful myriad glories for 99 bucks a year, which is cheaper than the 9.99 a month. Do your math. Don't be like Elizabeth Warren. Know how math works. Go check that out right now. And when you get that $99 a year subscription, you get this. The very greatest in beverage vessels. Look at this. Feast your eyes upon it. The leftist tears, hot or cold tumbler. Feel the inspiration you draw just from setting your eyes upon this glory. You're not going to know the power that flows through your body until you hold this thing in your hand. And that you're only going to be able to do that when you have a $99 a year subscription. Okay, go check that out. We have a bunch of great Sunday specials coming up too. Subscribe to iTunes, YouTube, leave us a review. Only five stars are accepted. Go check that out. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast in the nation. All right, so Hillary Clinton is the other side of the good Trump, bad Trump routine. So President Trump has good Trump and bad Trump. Hillary Clinton just has bad, bad Hillary. There is no such thing as good Hillary. So Hillary came out over the weekend and said that Bill Clinton should not have resigned over Monica Lewinsky because he did not abuse his power in any way. I do love that she is considered a hero, a heroine of the feminist movement. Pretty spectacular stuff from the left here. Here is Hillary McClinton. In retrospect, do you think Bill should have resigned in the wake of the Monica Lewinsky scandal? Absolutely not. It wasn't an abuse of power? No, no. There are people who look at the incidents of the 90s and they say a president of the United States cannot have a consensual relationship with an intern. The power imbalance is too great. Who was great. an adult. But let me ask you this. Where's the investigation of the current incumbent against whom numerous allegations have been made? So good. So good. So I, I love this. Trump should resign because of allegations against him, but her husband shouldn't resign because of allegations against him. Also, he didn't abuse power when he, 49-year-old president of the United States, was being serviced by a 22-year-old intern in the Oval Office. Not an abuse of power in any way. Good to know that power imbalance is no longer a concern for feminists on the left. Very exciting stuff. Also, Hillary came forth and said President Trump is a sexist. Of course, the reason that she knows Trump is a sexist is because Trump was mean to her. If you watched the way Trump debated me, it was just imbued with sexism, making fun of me for preparing. Well, you know, that's the old like, oh, yeah, the girl in the class who's always prepared. I don't need to be prepared. That really was not what happened at those debates. What happened is that Trump was as much of a jerk to her as he is to every other human being on the planet. And it didn't play well with her because she's one of the most deeply unlikable human beings on planet Earth. 
just love it. The, the Democrats have decided to full scale embrace the most radical version of themselves. You know, they say in acting that you have to get in touch with your authenticity. The Democrats are certainly getting in touch with their authenticity. The problem is that deep down, Democratic leadership, not particularly charming. Bernie Sanders is, is another example of this. So Bernie was on Jake Tapper's show on CNN. And Jake Tapper asked him about the inflammatory rhetoric on the part of some folks in the Democratic Party. And Bernie, a follower of whose shot up a bunch of Congress people last year, came out and said that it's not that bad if people get mobbed in public places. Like, it's, it's amazing that Bernie doesn't feel any necessity to say anything here about this sort of action. You know, I, listen again, I don't blame Bernie Sanders for that incident last year, because unless you're openly calling for violence, I don't blame you for somebody going and doing violence. But when Bernie Sanders refuses to condemn mobbing in public spaces, he certainly is not making the country a better place. Well, I'm, I am very strongly in favor of mobilizing the American people to stand up and fight for economic justice and social justice and racial and environmental justice. And I think we have to mobilize people. I am not a great fan of being rude or disrupting activities. But this is what I will say. This entire 2000 election campaign is going to come down to two words, and that is voter turnout. Okay, so he's not a big fan of people getting rude, but if people get rude, that's sort of the way that it is. And voter turnout, I don't want to dampen the enthusiasm. It just shows how the Democrats are willing to flirt with the mob politics they've been talking about for the last several months, really since Maxine Waters broke out into the open with it. And they're willing to do so on a, on a regular basis. They're even willing to validate mob violence on a regular basis. Over the weekend, the Washington Times reported that Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler came under fire over a viral video showing Antifa protesters blocking traffic and harassing drivers but he says he supports the decision by police to watch from a distance without getting involved. He says, I was appalled by what I saw in the video, but I support the Portland Police Bureau's decision not to intervene. The whole incident will be investigated. The video was posted by journalist Andy Nago, and it showed protesters, including members of Antifa and Black Lives Matter, blocking an intersection and attempting to direct traffic while officers on motorcycle watched from a block away. At one point, the activists chased down 74-year-old Kent Hauser after he made a right turn against their wishes, pounding on his silver Lexus and breaking a window. The car sustained thousands of dollars in damage, he told the Oregonian. But Mr. Wheeler insists the motorist should feel completely safe coming into downtown Portland. Well, all of this, this lack of law enforcement, this lack of crackdowns on Antifa, it leads to greater heights of violence when other people who are ready for violence show up in places where Antifa is. Now, here has been my recommendation for a very long time. I speak at a lot of public events where protesters show up. And in some of those events, protesters get violent. I mean, that, that, that's happened at Cal State Los Angeles. It happened at Penn State a little bit. Uh, it happened certainly at Berkeley where nine people were arrested. My recommendation has always been, because I've, there, there have been people who have said, well, should I come ready for self-defense? What I've always said is, look, if somebody hits you, then defending yourself is fine. But you should come ready to invoke the powers of the police. You should be ready to... Go to the police and let law enforcement take care of the problem. We live in a volatile climate enough that you don't have to go around spoiling for a fight. Because if you spoil for a fight, the media is just going to play it as though you were the instigator of the fight in the first place. The reason I bring this up is because over the weekend, there were a couple of violent incidents, one in New York and one in Portland. And it's just not good stuff. It's not good stuff. I'll explain. So first, Portland. So there was a, a march called the Patriot, the Patriot Pride, I believe. Um, and it, it happened in Portland over the weekend and it was, and it got ugly because Antifa showed up and people basically started beating the crap out of each other. Here's a little bit of the brawl. So if you can't see this, you can see people fighting with each other, like really swinging on each other. According to the Oregon Live, a demonstration billed as a march for law and order in the streets of Portland to send into chaos as rival political factions broke into bloody brawls downtown Saturday night. Members of the right-wing group Patriot Player and their black-clad black, black -clad adversaries, known as Antifa, used bear spray, bear fists, and batons to thrash each, each other outside Kelly's Olympian, a popular bar on Southwest Washington Street. The melee, which lasted more than a minute, ended when riot cops rushed in and fired pepper balls at the street fighters. Now, as I say, what's happening here is that groups like Patriot Prayer, which I, I are being cast as white nationalist, and I'm not seeing the strong enough evidence to say that this is a white nationalist group. Uh, in any case, 
and, and this is coming from a guy who's happy to, to say when I think people are white nationalists, right? I did two episodes after Charlottesville talking about white nationalism and the evils of the alt-right. Patriot Prayer was doing a march in Portland specifically because they wanted to show that Antifa was violent. Antifa showed up and it looked like Antifa instigated violence and the folks at Patriot Prayer then got into it with them, including some of the Proud Boys from Gavin McInnes' group um, and it got violent. Now, as I say, I think it is perfectly worthwhile to publicly march against violence. And I think it's okay to defend yourself too. But there's a difference between being willing to defend yourself and spoiling for a fight to the point where you are looking to beat the living crap out of somebody because, number one, you shouldn't be looking to beat the living crap out of people in aggressive fashion. Like once the guy's down, the guy's down. Now it's time for law enforcement to come in. And number two, it is perfectly obvious that the media are going to play this as though it is right-wing groups instigating violence as opposed to Antifa, which has been violent every single place it goes, instigating violence. Here's a little bit more video from that brawl in Portland. It's a little hard to see, but you can see folks are marching and then it's about to break down into violence. You can see in the front people hitting each other, swinging on each other, people shouting at each other. Okay, and then there was also a separate brawl in New York. So in New York, there was a, an event at the New York Metropolitan Club. That club had been defaced by allegedly Antifa uh, over the past couple of days. And there was an event for Gavin McInnes, who's the leader of the Proud Boys. Now, again, the media have labeled the Proud Boys a white nationalist group. They're members of the Proud Boys who are white nationalists. Gavin is not a white nationalist. I know Gavin. Gavin is not a white nationalist. Gavin, I think, needs to be more strict about who he involves as his friends. But to suggest that Gavin is a white nationalist ignores any part of his rhetoric. Uh, that, that's just not accurate. Now, with that said, do the Proud Boys spoil for a fight? Yeah, they do. And you can see that in this particular video in New York. Now, Antifa is claiming that the Proud Boys instigated the violence. The Proud Boys are claiming that Antifa instigated the violence. Apparently, after the event, they walked out. There were some Antifa members. Somehow the violence gets instigated, and you end up with basically 20 members of the Proud Boys kicking the living crap out of three members of Antifa. And they, they won't get off these guys. They're kicking them. And then eventually you'll see some members of sort of the surrounding crowd actually pulling people off of these guys um, because they don't want them, you know, getting arrested or killing somebody on the streets. Brawls fought in public streets. This is not civilization. It's not civilization. And if the police won't do their jobs, this is going to get worse and worse. And if mayors aren't going to do their jobs, it's going to get worse and worse. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo called on the FBI to investigate violent clashes connected to the Proud Boys, and he blamed President Trump for the hatred and violence he tied to the altercations. This is a state issue. This is not a federal issue. Okay, the state and city should investigate every one of these incidents, and the people who instigate violence should go to jail. If the city was doing that in the first place, these brawls would not be breaking out. We've seen them now in Sacramento. We've seen them a couple of times in Portland. We've seen them in Berkeley. We have seen them now in New York City. This is all ugly stuff. Yes, be ready to defend yourself. Don't go to events though spoiling for a fight. Be there in coordination with the police. If you're on the side of law enforcement, you're doing something right. And if the left refuses to allow law enforcement to do its job, this sort of stuff is going to become more and more prevalent. And that's horrible for the country. Truly, truly awful for the country. Okay, time for a couple of things that I like. So things that I like today. I was reading a couple of books over the weekend. Uh, the first was from a guy named Ray Connolly. So I went and visited Graceland. And I realized I didn't know very much about Elvis. So... I did what I always do. I went and I got a book on it. So there's a really good book called Being Elvis, A Lonely Life by Ray Connolly. And the book is fun and well-written and interesting. If you're a fan of Elvis's music, then it's a kick. So go check that out. Uh, Ray Connolly's Being Elvis, A Lonely Life. Really, it's an enjoyable read. And uh, I've been getting a kick out of it as well. Elvis's music, he's really, he's got an underrated voice, Elvis. And the more you listen to him, the more you realize that Elvis actually could sing, particularly his ballads. Right? Love Me Tender is a really well-sung song. Uh, and uh, the, the funny thing about Love Me Tender, right, which he made really popular, is that it is a 100-year-old Confederate ballad, I believe, from like the 1860s, 1850s, 1860s, redone, rearranged for a movie that he made, his first movie. In any case, you can go check that out. Okay, other things that I like this week. So Michael Savage, who's a, a radio talk show host, and I disagree with Michael on a lot of things. If you want a window into sort of the Trump movement, you know, the folks on the left who want a window into the Trump movement, they ought to check out Michael's books because Michael has been preaching a lot of the same sort of themes, some of which I agree with, some of which I disagree with, uh, that Trump has been on for a long time. There's a reason that Trump and Savage were close during the last election cycle. He has a new book out called Stop Mass Hysteria, America's Insanity from the Salem Witch Trials to the Trump Witch Hunt. 
about the left targeting Trump. You know, the, the, the left acts like they don't have a window into the mind of Trump people, like the Trump people are all crazy and that they don't have anybody articulating their viewpoint. Savage is a pretty good articulator of that viewpoint. So if, if folks want to know what a lot of the Trump base is thinking, Michael has a good beat on it. Go check out Stop Mass Hysteria. That's, that's Michael's new book. Again, don't agree with everything in the book, but I like windows into, into ideas, and, and Michael provides that for sure. Okay, other things that I like. So Bill Maher gets some credit today. He was on his show, and this is what I wish we had talked about when Maher had me on, was the, was the evils of political correctness. Instead, he wanted to talk Russia for some odd reason. But here's Bill Maher talking about liberals trying to crack down on people quoting Churchill and how insane all of this is. 80% in this new Atlantic story that published this poll, 80% of Americans see political correctness as a problem. And I think it's our problem. And I don't know why more mainstream liberals don't denounce the political correctness that they must know in private conversations is insane. Okay, and he's exactly right about all of this, of course. So good for Bill Maher. We give credit when it is due around here. Okay, time for a couple of things that I hate. So Israel has taken a policy that I think is very, very foolish. Uh, there's a, a policy where basically Israel has barred unhinged people from traveling to study in Israel. So there's this woman who's named is Lara Alkasam. She's 22. She's an American student of Palestinian descent. She arrived in Israel with an Israeli-issued visa to study in a master's program at Hebrew U. She never made it out of the airport. Israeli security officials detained her because of her past membership in Students for Justice in Palestine, which is indeed an anti-Semitic, anti-Israel group. They support BDS, a boycott, divestment, and sanctions policy toward the Jewish state. And now she is facing a deportation hearing. This is bad politics, and it is anti-First Amendment principles. Now, my view is this. The state of Israel does not have to give citizenship to anybody who wants to undermine the state of Israel, just as the United States does not have to give citizenship to anybody who wants to undermine the, the United States of America. As a general rule, bringing in people to study in your country, as long as they are paying their own way and is not taking public dollars, like I don't think we should be subsidizing that in the United States, but if somebody comes here and they are a socialist, for example, and they want to study in an engineering program here and they want to pay their own way, I don't see a big problem with that. And I think that it would be a mistake for the United States to bar people based on political viewpoint except when it comes to actually becoming citizens and integrating into the society. So Israel has no need to grant citizenship to this woman, al -Qassam. They They've been doing this for a few months, and I don't think it's smart. In April, Catherine Frank, this Barry Weiss and, and Brett Stevens reporting at the New York Times, a professor at Columbia, was, inter was interrogated and then deported from Israel on charges of being a leader of Jewish Voice for Peace, which is another organization that endorses BDS. In August, Simone Zimmerman, an American Jewish activist who lives in Israel and is a founder, if not now, which is a group that uh, is also pro-BDS, was held at the Israeli border for more than three hours and quizzed on her political views. Peter Beinart, who is an absolute schmuck of a human being, but he is a, he's a left-wing Zionist, supposedly. He's also quasi-pro-BDS. He was on his way to his niece's bat mitzvah in Israel, and he was detained and questioned. This is foolish for people who are just visiting. If you think they're an actual security threat, like a real security threat, like they're raising money against Israel, then, then you have every right to ban them. But if they're just there and they're left wing, let them in, make, you know, have them leave when their visa expires, and that's that. Uh, this, is, this is bad policy. I feel the same way about Israel as I do about the United States. On free speech basis, this seems counterproductive and foolish. I agree with Brett and Barry when they say Israel, like all countries, has a right to protect its borders and to determine who is allowed in and out. But Israel is also a state that prides itself on being a liberal democracy, a fact that goes far to explain the longstanding support for Israel among American Jews and non-Jews alike. If liberalism is about anything, it's about deep tolerance for opinions we find foolish, dangerous, and antithetical to our own. So detaining folks is, uh, is not a worthwhile goal. I think this is right, but you don't have to give citizenship to anybody, nor do you have to give public benefits to anybody. And that's where I would draw the line, where I, Israel, I feel the exact same way about the United States. Okay, other things that I hate. So speaking of media bias, insane piece in the New York Times over the weekend talking about Jared Kushner and his taxes. So Ever since Nikki Haley suggested that Jared Kushner is a smart guy, the media have decided that they are on the warpath for Kushner. They have two separate lines of attack over the past several days. Line of attack number one, Jared Kushner is close with the MBS, Mohammed bin Sultan, the Saudi prince responsible allegedly for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, who is that Saudi dissident. So Jared is close with the Saudi government. Therefore, it's Jared's fault the Saudi government did something bad. I'd like to see that logic applied to every American president for the last 60 years. I'd like to see that logic apply because that logic simply does not hold. If anybody has an alternative in Saudi Arabia we can get behind, I am happy to hear it. Otherwise, 
Jared Kushner working with Mohammed bin Sultan before he knew about a murder seems to me not a terrible idea, considering that Mohammed, it, it's worth noting here that Mohammed bin Sultan has been militantly opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood and also opposed to the Iranians, meaning we have global interests in the Saudi government. We have actual interests in the Saudi government. That doesn't mean that we can't smack them when they do something wrong, as we should. But to blame Jared Kushner for this is just ridiculous and silly. The other line of attack is that Jared didn't pay his taxes. So according to the New York Times, over the past decade, Jared Kushner's family company has spent billions of dollars buying real estate. His personal stock investments have soared. His net worth has quintupled to almost $324 million. And yet for several years running, Mr. Kushner appears to have paid almost no federal income taxes, according to confidential financial documents reviewed by the New York Times. His low tax bills are the result of a common tax minimizing maneuver that year after year generated millions of dollars in losses for Mr. Kushner. But the losses were only on paper because his company didn't actually appear to lose money. The losses were driven by depreciation, which is a tax benefit that lets real estate investors deduct a portion of the cost of their buildings from their taxable income every year. In 2015, for example, Kushner took home $1.7 million in salary and investment gains, but those earnings were swamped by $8.3 million of losses, largely because of significant depreciation Kushner and his company took on their real estate. So here's the question. Did he break the law? Here's the New York Times. Nothing in the document suggests Mr. Kushner or his company broke the law. So why is this an article? So the article is Jared Kushner paid his taxes, but he didn't actually owe taxes, so he didn't pay taxes. How exactly is that an attack? And this is it's just, it's cynical. I mean, really, that's cynical stuff. If you don't like the tax code, argue against the tax code, but don't blame people for abiding by the actual law of the land in the United States. Okay, time for a quick Federalist paper, and then we'll be out of here. So we are all the way up to Federalist 47, written by, written by James Madison. And this one is really fascinating because it talks about the original concept of separation of powers. Madison says that tyranny is a failure of the separation of powers. He says, quote, the accumulation of all powers legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. In other words, if you have a branch that has arrogated to itself judicial power, executive power, and legislative power, that would be a tyranny. And he says that if the Constitution were really chargeable with the accumulation of that sort of power, then no further arguments would be necessary to inspire a universal reprobation of the system. He does say, listen, there are parts where the executive does legislative stuff and parts where the legislative does executive stuff and parts where the judiciary does legislative stuff. But if they arrogate extensive and exclusive power of one of the other branches, that is tyranny. So he quotes Montesquieu, the French philosopher Montesquieu, who was the progenitor of this idea of checks and balances. He says his meaning as his own words import and still more conclusively as illustrated by the example in his eye can amount to no more than this that where the whole power of one department is exercised by the same hands which possess the whole power of another department, the fundamental principles of a free constitution are subverted. This would have been the case in the constitution examined by him if the king, who was the sole executive magistrate, had also possessed the complete legislative power or the supreme administration of justice. Montesquieu objected to the merger of the executive and the legislative. So here is a quote from Montesquieu. When the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or body, there can be no liberty because the apprehensions may arise lest the same monarch or senate should enact tyrannical laws to execute them in a tyrannical manner. He said, were the power of judging joined with the legislative, the life and liberty of the subject would ex be exposed to arbitrary control, for the judge would then be the legislator. Were it joined to the executive power, the judge might behave with all the violence of an oppressor. So the argument right now in the United States is whether this is what's heck actually happened with the executive branch. The executive branch basically legislates. Not basically, they do. The regulatory power of the executive branch is legislative power. Now, you can argue that's not the whole legislative power because Congress can trump that. But Congress has failed to trump that. If you actually would like to see a check and balance again, Congress has to take back some of that power. Congress is doing some of that. Under President Trump, they were involved in, in a legislative move where they basically were knocking down regulations at a pretty rapid rate. That's good and necessary. The executive power has also gained the judiciary power. You have administrative agencies with their own hearings boards. This is one of the reasons why there's been a lot of focus on a case called Chevron. Chevron is a Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court suggested the judiciary has to grant administrative deference to administrative agencies. So you have a case in front of the EPA, you go to the EPA board, the EPA administrative board gives you a judicial decision. The question is whether the judiciary can trump that decision. Chevron says in many cases, no. That's why Chevron is wrong. It's why Justice Gorsuch, has opposed Chevron. It's why Justice Kavanaugh opposes Chevron. Chevron should be struck down 
just for these checks and balances to be restored. Arrogation of too much power in one branch is the essence of tyranny that remains as true today as when the Constitution was written. Okay, we will be back here tomorrow with all of the latest, presumably including full stories of Elizabeth Warren's time with the Native American tribes riding the crab-ridden plains of Oklahoma. We'll have all of it for you tomorrow. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Senya Villarreal, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, and our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Caramina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire Ford Publishing production. Copyright Ford Publishing 2018.